Hey everyone, welcome to the show. And I'm here with Luke Roman. Luke, welcome back to the show. I think this is your millionth uh, <laughs> time on the Investors Podcast. So welcome. Thanks for me back. I'm uh, uh, I'm I'm very happy to be back. So it's uh, it's great to be here. So what's new, man? There's I don't know. There's a lot going on. Everything's everything's good here. Things hopefully hopefully you and the family are well. There's there's certainly a lot going on macro wise. Oh my lord, macro wise, it's uh, it seems like we've just been on this trip, like this rocket ship that has just kept going, and now all of a sudden, like the engines are starting to sputter and. Uh, <laughs> They're like, hey, maybe this is just a little too good to be true. Like, what's going on? So, from yeah. your vantage point, what is that? I think it's a very good way of phrasing it. I think if we go back to, let's, you know, if you go back to um, probably mid eighteen, um, say, hey, we're Fed's going to taper, and we've got this thing, and we had the crisis, and we did everything we had to do, and we told you we were going to normalize the balance sheet, and we're normalizing the balance sheet, and we told you we could sell these bonds, and then you had sort of the first rupture of, of, of FX hedge treasury yields going negative, and that was sort of that was sort of fit and start one, and that rolled into early 19, where you had uh, interest on excess, or Fed funds go over interest on excess reserves, which wasn't supposed to happen, that was fit start number two, then you saw the economy slow, yield curve flatten. You had the repo rate spike, which was effectively a, a, a supply demand problem in the treasury market, uh, made worse by regulatory problems. And so all of a sudden we went from, you know, uh, you know, <laughs> look at me, mom, I can fly to, you know, that's, that's not flying, that's falling with style to, uh, uh, to paraphrase Toy Story, if, if, if you ever watched that one with your kids. And uh, so we get to 3Q19, it's, it's not QE, so we're regrowing the balance sheet again, but it's not QE, and that was sort of, uh, you know, quick, hit the boosters again, guys, you know, um, on your rocket ship metaphor. We obviously, I think the COVID thing in the first quarter of 2020 was, um, was a surprise, um, and I, I, I think they did what they had to do to basically stop what was a, a debt deflation liquidation spiral uh, dollar super spike that would have happened. Uh, uh, you cannot keep markets open and close down all the stores because everyone will just liquidate markets for cash uh, and the dollar will go to infinity and everything else will go to zero and, and you know, uh, et cetera. And so uh, that brings to the sort of the turbo charge, which was if you go back to 08, we're supposed to get all this inflation and Lynn Alden's done a tremendous job highlighting this. We've talked about it a bit where, uh, and, and really it, it, I would point to, uh, I think really the, uh, uh, the, the grandfather of, or the, uh, uh, the grandmaster of this work was professor Richard Werner, R professor Richard Werner, uh, highlighting basically that QE is the U S did it basically kept all of the, uh, uh, all of the, uh, liquidity in the financial system. So we had asset inflation, but we didn't have broad inflation. And of course, this time around, it was a broad real economy problem and they changed the formula. They, the U S government, uh, handed a bunch of money out to consumers, uh, and then they issued treasury bonds to the banks. And then the fed bought the money, bought the treasury bonds from the banks, put it on their balance sheet. And lo and behold, we got a ton of inflation. And I think with that as background, I think when we came into probably March, April of this year, I think the Fed had that feeling when you talk about the, the opposite feeling of like, uh oh, the, the rocket engines on the, on the jet are stalling. But it's, it's almost like the, uh, you know, the first time I ever went downhill skiing. So back in 05, my wife and I, I, I decided I want to try a downhill scheme. I'm here in Cleveland. I might as well do something in the wintertime. So we, we're going to go get ski lessons. We go to the local Boston Mills, which is like, you know, your little bunny hill and I strap on some skis. I get a couple lessons. Woohoo. All right, honey, let's go skiing. I hear Jackson Hole is nice. So we go to Jackson Hole, which unbeknownst <laughs> to me are the most vertical slopes in North America uh, in the contiguous 48. And I take one day of lessons there, three hours worth. Instructor goes, hey, you're you know, you're ready to go onto the blues now. So, okay, I'll go on the blues. And so I go on the blues. No one tells me till I get up there that the blues in Jackson are like the blacks everywhere else in the country. And so I get up to the top, the sky's darker blue, like, like you're like leaving <laughs> the atmosphere. You're so high up. Everything's way down. And so I get going down the hill 
And the reason I tell the story is, is I think come March, April of this year, the Fed was having the experience that I had um, <laughs> in Jackson with a grand total of four hours of lessons on the blues going downhill, which is like, okay, I'm balanced, but I'm picking up speed and I have no idea how to stop. Right. And so, <laughs> you know, what I did was I turned myself into a yard sale. I, as it was, as a phrase I learned by becoming one. So I basically just, luckily I told them, put the bindings on lightly I hit it and left sort of everything up the hill. Uh, I think the Fed sort of did a yard sale come May, June with their, oh my God, you know, Bitcoin's at 60,000, home prices are rising at 25% a year, we're having shortages of everything. Um, you, you're seeing lumber at 1600 bucks a board foot. You know, wow, we could generate inflation. And I think quite frankly, they were shocked how much inflation they got for what they thought was just a little crank of the dial of, hey, let's just generate a little inflation. So I think I agree that we are now at this, uh oh, it feels like the rocket engines are maybe giving out a bit. And I think four months ago, we were in the exact opposite, which was sort of like, oh, my God, we are picking up speed faster and faster. How do I how do I get off this ride? Um, and it kind of ties back to something we've said is once you get debt to this high, they're not operating a dial anymore. They're operating a switch. And so, you know, Mar I, our view is March, April, the switch was, here we go, inflation. Uh, and they tr they're trying to pull it back. They're trying to pretend like they still have a dial. But I think when you start talking about QE taper and some of the things we've seen in terms of the stimulus rolling off and not be replaced, all those things I think we're watching in real time combined with Delta, combined with uh, the China slowdown that's been going on for the, really the last three or four months when you look at some of the China credit impulse things. Um, I think those things have all come together. And now this, this Evergrande, I think, is, is just uh, sort of the, the, the weakest link or, or where the pressures are manifesting. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's a very good metaphor is, hey, uh oh, the, the engines on this rocket ship have gone from scaring us because they're going so fast to scaring us because they're, they're, they're we're, we're, we're maybe starting to you know lose escape velocity. I like your analogy there as far as it being a switch that's not a dial anymore. It's binary. It's either on or it's off. And like when you kick it on, it's like, oh my God. <laughs> um, wait, so if you're gonna if you're gonna say what is causing the CPI gauge specifically to start uh demonstrating that fiat units are being added into the system. Because, I mean, they've been doing this since 2008, 2009. They've just been doing it through the bond market. So is it because of the triple P loans? Is it because uh, so so much of this uh, debasement that has occurred since the 2020, the March 2020 uh, COVID shock, is it because they're mailing checks out to people? Is it because of those factors that it, the, the UBI-like UBI activities is that what's causing the 5% prints that we're seeing? Or is there something else going on that, that we're missing? I think it's a combination of that. And I think it's a combination of what we're seeing with um, what's happening with supply chains related to COVID. And then I think too, I'm, I'm still not convinced that there isn't some element where China isn't slow steaming stuff to us just to sort of you know yeah. stick it in our eye regarding what we've been doing to them with um, some of their national champions like Huawei and some of this trade war stuff for the last three years under Trump and now continuing under Biden. And so I, but I think from, from the monetary touch, touch on that more, touch on that more before you go into your next point, because are they shutting down the ports because of quote unquote COVID reasons, and then just totally messing up the <laughs> supply chain on purpose, or is there other things that you think that they might be doing? So the short answer is I have, I have, I have no way of proving that. I've asked people yeah. in that in, in that chain. Here, here's what I know. I've talked with several different people in the supply chain, in the international container shipping business. Uh, those people are telling me in 20 plus years in the business, they've never seen it like this. They are seeing, um, and it's a perfect storm. Uh, the container shipping, uh, the asset owners uh, have been basically in purgatory since 08. Um, and unfortunately for them, what they did as we were moving into 08 and just after 08 was load up buying the biggest possible boats they could buy because that's how you, 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 you derive uh, 
uh, efficiencies of scale in that business, right? You take you trade in your six thousand TEU boat, and you buy a twelve thousand TEU boat, and that way, you know, now the worst time to do that is right before your demand goes from eight thousand back to five thousand. <laughs> so that's what they did, and so they've been burned, and now uh, they've been consolidating, they've been uh, tightening up capacity. The gist of it is, is that the boats are all full and there's no more boats come until 24 or 25 at the earliest, assuming no more delays to building. So capacity is not going to grow. Then when you look at what's happening with uh, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, um, yeah, you've got problems with the ports to start with. Uh, you've got these co you've got COVID cases. So I think it was Ningbo a few weeks ago, which is I think their fifth biggest port was shut down for, I think, two weeks uh, for a single COVID case. One case. One case. And so one of my friends said, if it's one guy, why don't you just send them home? And so there's- I mean, you could, you could even lie that it was 100 people. And right. nobody, nobody's going to question that. They'd be like, oh, yeah, it sounds about like a- <laughs> Right. A and number. so it's like, you know, there's something going on there. So either the Chinese are lying and it's like, a thousand people, it's everybody, which is possible. Or, and this is something I experienced when, so I used to work at a firm where we had this, we had this great ag analyst and uh, she covered names like ADM and Bungie and, and Tyson and all these. So she was, she was very tied in with grain shipments. And of course, China's a huge player in that. And something the Chinese would do from time to time in that business would be, oops, we ordered too much crap. We're, 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 we're heavy soybeans. We got to sort of run down the inventories. We've got no place to put the stuff. And so what they would do is they'd go, hey, that boat has GMO soybeans that are against our regulations. Send it back or go get it inspected and come back to us. And, and of course, they weren't GMO soybeans because you don't send a gigantic boat of soybeans to China without knowing what's on the darn thing. Uh, but what it was was just an inventory management as a way to kind of smooth things out. So is it beyond the, the realm of credit, you know, of, of, of credulity to think the Chinese couldn't be going, all right, you're going to mess with Huawei. You're going to screw with us on, on some of this stuff. Watch this. Uh, and so what they do is they shut down Ningbo for two weeks. And now between the capacity issues, there's things called blank sailings, which I had never heard of in this business before. But what a blank sailing is when the boat pulls up to the port and the boat's already full. So the boat just kind of looks at the port, looks at all the stuff on the port and just keeps right on sailing by and waits for them. It's like a bus being too full, right? You just, uh, another one will be by in half an hour. And in the case of these things, they're by in, I guess, four to six more days. The net of it is, is in the meantime, stuff keeps pouring into the port and you keep having. So I think there's this perfect storm of supply chain. If there is the, an element of the Chinese sort of slow steaming us to gum up our supply chains, I think it's a minor part of the story. Like I said, I don't think it's beyond the realm of possibility, but I, I you know, to be clear, I don't think that's like a, big, a huge part of what's going on. I think it could be sort of the, the the cherry on top of what's happening here. How about the incentives to not work here in here in the U.S. and maybe other places? I'm I'm not as familiar internationally if they're dealing with other these these social um, incentives to just stay at home. Um, are those contributing as well? I know Lynn has, you alluded to Lynn's piece on inflation. We'll have a link to that in the show notes. It's incredible when she gets into some of these ideas, but I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on it. Sure. Yeah. So I think from the monetary side, like Lynn's talked about, if you go back to August of 2019, former Fed Vice Chair Stan Fisher wrote a white paper for the BlackRock Institute uh, called Dealing with the Next Downturn. And uh, Philip Hildebrand, former head of the Swiss National Bank, uh, and Jean Boyvin, former Bank of Canada governor, worked with him on that paper. It was an incredible paper at the time because it was basically, in the next crisis, we're out of room. What's going to happen is governments are going to spend a bunch of money and we're going to monetize it and pin yields to make sure that the fiscal stimulus does not drive interest rates up and offset the benefit of the fiscal stimulus, which was exactly what they did to a T. And what's interesting, or there's a number of really interesting things about this paper, but as it relates to this discussion, uh, to this discussion vis-a-vis inflation, one of the interesting things it said is Fisher, who is, who's considered the godfather of central banker, he trained Bernanke, he trained Yellen, he trained yeah. Draghi, right? He said, the issue is not whether we can generate inflation. 
we know this will generate inflation. Governments hand out money. We buy the bonds. It's, it's, it's the very definition of helicopter money. Uh, you're just giving out money to the populace. This will generate inflation. He said the challenge is, is that there are no examples in history of using this to generate just a little bit of fine-tuned inflation, which gets back to the whole it's on or it's off. Like this is not, you know, this is, this is not sort of, yeah, this is not like, a, a, you know, a Navy SEAL sniper, you know, sort of trying to pick off a couple of Taliban over in Afghanistan. This is like, hey, get the B-52s over here. That valley, I want it all gone, right? And they, that's what they're doing. So they talked about it. They did it. They got their inflation. And I think, quite frankly, uh, it scared the heck out of them because I don't think they thought supply chains would break down as fast as they did, about which they can do nothing. And, um, and I think that ties back to both the point before of some of the COVID stuff, some of the, in, in the supply chain stuff, some of the China stuff. And to your point about the disincentives to work, I think that is certainly an element of it. I did see something interesting the other day that in the states that have pulled off the unemployment benefits, they've not really seen any increase in employment, which I, I think is... There's a couple other things I think that are going on. I think one of them is, I mean, I see this in my own house where last several, and you always got to be careful with your own example, but my son for last several summers has done landscaping work. And, and all my buddies that are landscapers, like I can't find people. I'm paying 15 an hour, 17 an hour, 18 an hour. And my son who did it for three straight years, he's going, I'm door dash. I'm, make, I'm, I'm, I'm making 30 bucks an hour door dash. Wow. So like the, the clearing rate of pay for some of these entry level jobs may has maybe particularly for dependent because my kid is dependable. Like he tells you you're going to be there, he's going to be there. Right. Uh, and he can pass any drug test you want. God, God, God love him. Uh, at least he better be able to No, I'm just kidding. I know, I, I know, <laughs> I know he can. And so this, the, the clearing wage for the, for, yeah, I, I think has moved in some areas where just this marginal supply of labor. So I think, in some places, you're seeing a supply demand mismatch, mismatch of labor. I think some of it's being driven by some niche things like DoorDash and Uber Eats and some of these things where you can make pretty good money um, with not a lot of hours. And, 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 you know, quite frankly, it's a lot easier to DoorDash than it is to landscape all day. Uh, but I think the other thing that's been going on and I think is going to con is getting worse and will continue to get worse is the reaction of certain workforces related to, to some of the mandates as it relates to, and I don't want to blow up your show, but the, you know, um, the, you know, some of these, these restrictions that have been introduced recently. With COVID, um, yeah, exactly. And so you're seeing that all over. You've seen bus drivers quit. You're hearing uh, nurses quit. You're seeing, I mean, I saw something today where like hundreds of Navy SEALs are, are saying, no, done. We're, we're done. I'm done. I'm not going to do it. And, Without getting into the politics of that, I think that dynamic is also, uh, I mean, it's really interesting. We wrote about this in a report a couple weeks ago. One of our reports was that uh, unsolicited, a friend of ours who's a, an RIA at a national firm said they are getting so many inbound calls from people planning to quit their job or switch careers over these mandates that they've actually taken to calling it the great resignation internally. And so they're getting so many inbound calls of, to, of hey, Mr. Financial Planner, Mrs. Financial Planner, can you help me set up my finances in a way I'm going to quit my job because I don't want to do this and I'm just going to use this as, a, as an opportunity to change. I don't and want to wear a mask for eight hours a day. No. Yeah. No. People were just like, I got to find a different job that allows me to not have to do that. And I, th and I think, too, the... I think the way a couple Pandora's boxes were opened last year, I think one was sort of, I think, and I tweeted about this last week that I, I, I'm getting this increasing sense that sort of the general populace out here in flyover country had its eyes open to how the money system actually works in this country as a result of how uh, the Fed responded. And so I think there is a great deal of people that never gave an ounce of thought to the banking and money and going, wait a second. They can just print it up out of thin air and hand it out. And like, that's it. Like, why am I paying taxes again? Why am I? And, and so I think 
and that that I think is part of it. But I think the other part of it is um, uh, this this element of hey, I worked from home and it was it was awesome. And I don't ever want to go back to an office and I will, you know, I can be very productive. And I, and I think there is broadly speaking, sort of a, a supply demand mismatch between, you know, very you know, talented people and positions. And I think we're living through that. And I think that's then reverberating back into these supply issues, et cetera. You know, uh, when you're looking across the the spectrum of where these things are impacted, I mean, it's just across the board. But the one that I think is just so obvious is in uh, the builders, people building new homes, uh, developers, and you're just seeing this this uh, split between pre existing home prices and new builds, and these people that are that are halfway in between having a house constructed right now and the cost of labor, the cost of materials is, and we're not talking like these 5% numbers that are getting reported. I'm sorry, but those, you're not seeing a 5% increase in the, in the cost of building a new house. I mean, the numbers are somewhat mind blowing how high that, that difference is. And so when I turn to China and I look at what's the company that's blowing up right now, this Evergrande, and what line of business are they in? And they're they're a real estate developer with three hundred billion in liabilities, and two hundred of the two hundred of the three hundred billion are in uh, like halfway produced or or constructed um, real estate. I'm thinking this isn't just a U.S. problem. Maybe this is a this is a global problem that we're seeing everywhere. Um, and more importantly, to question you, Luke, is, is this a Lehman type event? Is this really as big of a deal that everybody's making it to be? Um, what are some of your thoughts around this Evergrande? I mean, we had so many questions in the comments uh, about this particular <laughs> issue. So I think, I, I don't know if it's another Lehman as it relates to the banking sector. Um, there are people that really understand the the people that understand the China banking sector that I've read don't seem to think so based on how the China system is structured and, and intuitively to me that makes sense because if you've got a uh, if you've got a um, state owned company effectively that's borrowed a bunch of renminbi from state owned banks. And then defaults on those in the process of building assets in China, then you, at least on that portion of the issue, there's no systemic connections to the outside world. There's no, and that's why I say purely a Lehman problem. There's no, as far as we know at this point, you know, it's not like somebody was buying credit default swaps on whatever. There's no, financial leverage multiplier within that. If, if it's all state owned, if it, it, it's almost like, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear, it doesn't make a sound, right? So if, if a state owned company defaults to a state owned bank in the state currency, it's, it's so like you move it from this side of the ledger to the other and, and no one's out, you know, it's a domestic political problem for China there. But so that portion of it, I would say, I don't know that it's a Lehman problem based on what I've read from the people that understand the Chinese banking system and how that works, which I am not a Chinese banking system guy. Now, with that said, where you get contagion risks, where I do think there are contagion risks, and I think these are almost more like um, old-fashioned contagion, right? Like, we're all so scarred from Lehman. It's like, oh, gosh, okay, it's, it's got to work through the banks. Well, when I came up in this business, my first my first crisis was fall of ninety seven. It was the Asian crisis, and I it was one of these things where um, Asia Pacific was only five percent of Eaton's business, Parker Hannafin's business, Boeing's business, and but it was like thirty percent of the growth of revenues, and as you know, so it was when you just looked at it, oh, it's only 5% of their business. I don't have to worry about Indonesia, Thailand, South Korea, all these things. And that's October of 97. ISM in the US is at 55. Woohoo, party on, party, you know, party on Wayne, party on Girl. 
Five months later, ISM's at 47, the industrial sector is in a, in a recession in the US and these stocks have all been haircut 40, 60%. And so that is where I think if there's going to be a contagion, I think it could be sort of an old fashioned contagion. And which is to say, um, when you talk about the inflation in, in building materials, construction materials, if you take, if this goes from just being an Evergrande to being a, hey, China's just going to pause for a year for construction, then you get into a situation where, you know, cat's orders, you know, Caterpillar's orders go from flat oh, yeah. against all-time highs, they're down 30%, and their earnings numbers come down. And, and now there, we actually, that's, that to me is the potential transmission mechanism to the outside world. Somebody else made a really good point the other day of European luxury goods, right, where if the Chinese, if there's enough Chinese financially harmed by this, that uh, that they just stop buying luxury goods for a bit, it, you, there's another transmission. So I think you have to look at these transmission mechanisms and see where they exist. And then once we understand if other transmission mechanisms exist, then we have the multiplicative effect, which is the system's too levered. It's too levered at the sovereign. It's too levered at the corporate. It's too levered at the household level. Um, then you're going to have problems because tax receipts fall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where I think to me, based on what, how I've looked at it so far, where I think the biggest risks are, but again, with a huge, take that with a huge block of salt, because I just don't know the Chinese banking system well enough to make a, 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 a you know, a statement that, you know, yes, it's, it's, it's a Lehman or no, but it's the people that I've read that know it so far don't think it is. Yeah. I mean, I think your, your point is, is well taken. It's, I mean, it's not a free and open market for the most part. The, right. the Chinese government's going to either step in or they're not going to step in. And if they're not going to step in, it's going to be for some type of strategic interest, mm-hmm. or it's going to be because of some policy that they're trying to uh, de-risk the population because they own too much real estate. So one of the things that I hear is a policy or an, an initiative uh, for the CCP is this idea of common prosperity is the buzzword where they want everybody, and this is why they were smushing Jack Ma and other famous billionaires over there is like, hey, we don't want these influencers of wealth and capitalism to really kind of have a voice or have any type of influence within, within the population. And so when I'm looking at that idea and whether that would run, and then I'm also looking at just strategically, um, does China have an interest in kind of letting this thing go? And uh, you know, these people that were highly levered and everything else, just kind of letting them pay the price and letting them be kind of an example within within their country. Um, I it wouldn't surprise me, I guess, is is how I would respond. It, I'm curious how you see that particular piece. I think that makes a lot of sense. And it was interesting. I saw someone today saying that it's their tra- the, the, the common prosperity. Part of that is trying to keep housing affordable for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Which is ironic, right? Because right now, if I take a step back and I look at it, like put on my, I'm a two year old hat and go, the communists are trying to make housing more affordable and they're trying to let capital markets work and let somebody take a loss to learn a lesson. And the capitalists are doing whatever they <laughs> the can to essentially plan the, the exact opposite. Yeah. The exact opposite, right? We're trying to make housing as expensive as we can and and build as much political fragmentation in the society as we can over it. It's a, so it, it's I, I I think you could I that makes sense to me. I don't I you Bizarro know, world. <laughs> it, 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 it really is. And it's, and I think it all, like the only, th- if you look, the only thing the U S try is trying that hard to cap are Bitcoin and gold, right? Like, like though, though they have no problem with anyone who owns Bitcoin or gold getting taken out to the woodshed and getting beaten, but any, anything else, you know, the national team's got your back, right? You know, you can't lose in bonds. You can't lose in housing. You can't lose in stocks. Um, you know, but, but yeah, assets that sort of, and, and you could see sort of, it's interesting, from that you can divine sort of the national interest, right? The, the national interest is King Dollar, we, we, you know, and Washington, D.C., sort of that, that you know, the 1% and, and King Dollar is, is anything that moves us away from the dollar is bad. And, and I think in China, 
if that's what they're trying to do, you know, they're trying to sort of manage this, you know, sort of over debt laden society with, you know, they're, they're trying to keep social stability uh, and, and sort of, so, you know, so continuing on the theme of bizarro world, um, for me, this is the elephant in the room. It's just like so, uh, I mean, it's just like a clown with the clown hair and the clown nose when I think about this right here. The 10-year treasury is at 1.32%. <laughs> the CPI print for what? The last five months has been 5%. We'll just call it 5%. The last one, last month was 5.3%. I mean, that's just, it's total insanity. So as a fixed income investor or somebody who's looking at this, this spread of 400 basis points, that is, you know, a negative 4% real return between those two. Like how long can something like that last Luke? This is maddening. (laughs) I think the people that have noted that people buying these bonds aren't buying them for the yield i think are yeah. exactly right right they're they i've had people say and and i think you know i think they're 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 brilliant people i think they're very smart and i think they're i think they're right the they're being regulated into buying these bonds right these bonds these bonds are not an investment they're pristine collateral right and it sounds a lot better when you say pristine collateral and as long as there's no other currencies that could come in and and Supplant the existing currency. Supplant the exa- yeah. exactly right. So it's, but then you have to. It's a chicken and the egg question. If why, so so here's the che- sequence of events. Three Q fourteen. Global central banks effectively stop buying treasuries. Three Q fourteen. Banks start being regulated into buying treasuries as high quality liquid assets. The next year, money market funds get regulated into holding government bonds instead of corporate and private sector money market funds. Um, you get all this regulation that says that you have to buy treasuries and you get the benefit. It's, it's pristine collateral. You don't get a haircut against it. You get the, the beneficial treatment of your banks, money market funds, et cetera. Why? No one asks why. And the answer is the U.S. has a supply demand problem in the treasury market. And this is how they're dealing with it. And we have the leeway to do this because we're the world's reserve currency issuer. We are the Saudi Arabia of money. Uh, but what we're doing is no different than what Argentina did in 2000, 2001. They ran out of foreign financing and they said, hey, banks, we are going to regulate you, domestic banks, into buying our, our Argentine debt. We will give you an attractive rate. We will give you an attractive capital um, uh, uh, haircut against it. It's, 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 it's pristine collateral. Now, that's not to say we're immediately in that type of problem, but this is directionally the same type of action. And so... The sixty-four thousand dollars question is: Is are we going to go right back? You know, the only way you can hold this bond as an investment, and and the only way this game can go on forever, um, is, is, is an investment is you're going to get some sort of reversion to the mean, right? That five percent CPI is going to go to you know negative five CPI. Now, maybe that happens. The other way you keep this game going is is if. And this is how it appears is the treasury market is increasingly not being driven by investors. It's being driven by its demand as pristine collateral, right? Those aren't investing bonds. Those are, those are trading sardines. Those are, those are pristine collateral treasuries. Then as long as the market trends, preferably up, because that's where you need tax receipts, you need tax receipts up and you can't get tax receipts up if markets trend down. As long as markets keep going up without too many sharp fall-offs, then you could, in theory, keep this treasury funding because it's pristine collateral, leveraging, you know, leveraged play asset prices on the upside going for as long as you can keep asset prices going up. Because it's all relative to the other sovereign debt that's out there, and they're all at nothing percent. It, it, so. it, right. And, and, you know, the challenge in, in the, and where the problem I have with the, well, it makes sense because this 5% CPI is going to mean revert to negative 5% CPI as soon as the Fed's done. The thing I find that that argument always leaves out is that um, at negative 5% CPI, right, at, at positive real rates, U.S. government defaults on entitlements or treasuries or defense or some combination of all of the above. Once you get to 130% debt to GDP, negative 5 CPI prints are not 
possible. Uh, they're not sustainable well, for more than like a few weeks. And it's not accounting for the issues that, that we were talking about earlier. That's really driving your CPI is all these supply chain impacts. Like you can't go out there and find anybody to work. And if you do, they want top dollar. The cost of commodities are blowing out because they just don't have the supply versus the demand of people that are getting checks in the mail that are going out there and saying, Hey, you know what? I think I'm going to uh, put a new bookcase in my house, or I'm going to put a new deck out there on the porch or whatever. Well, um, even last week, I don't know if you saw that they're talking about a 6% cost of living increase for social security next year. You think they got 6% more dollars sitting in a vault somewhere? Where do you think that's <laughs> going to come from? Like, yeah. They're going to print it. They're going to hand it out. They're going to bur it out. Yeah. They're going to bur it out. Hey, uh, so one of the things that kind of has me scratching my head right now is you got Powell and the, the Federal Reserve talking about how they're going to tighten and how they're going to, uh, you know, and I, I had a comment with a gentleman who's the, uh, you know, a, a big uh, analyst over at Fidelity. And I was asking him like, hey, what do you think is going to happen here? Do you actually believe that they're going to tighten here? And he was like, yeah, I kind of think that they, that they might, like they're going to stick to the course, even with all this Evergrande and everything else that's happening in China. So like, you know, this isn't going to air for another six days or whatever, but um, they're having the feds having a meeting on Wednesday. Are they going to come out and just play this, this back and forth? Like we're dovish today. We're, we're, we're going to tighten tomorrow. Or are they going to really kind of stick to that narrative that they're going to tighten at this point? I'm just kind of scratching my head thinking there's no way. So I, I, I think there's two questions here. When I, when I, and we've written quite a bit about this over the last couple, couple three months, which is nominally, yes, I think they're going to tighten. I think they're going to QE taper. And that's going to be the headlines, Fed QE taper. And that's what we're all going to see. And the markets might even sell off a little bit. Maybe the Dow goes down 300 points. People freak out. Now, what's been going on in sort of the fine print over here is, is Fed has already established FIMA swap lines. Uh, with a number of different foreign creditors. Fed has the reverse repo set up, and we know that balance is going up and up and up and up and up. And Fed's been talking about establishing the standing repo facility for treasuries and mortgage backs uh, that's, uh, I think, open for comments in October. I think they want it launched in November. So I, gun to my head, I don't think they announced taper this week, tomorrow, whenever they're talking. I think they uh, talk that they're going to do it soon. Um, yeah. And And the point is, is that if you actually taper with this hand, the headlines, while you have a standing repo facility open for domestic people here and the foreign swap lines for foreigners over here, you're taking away liquidity here in, in sort of big dollops on the headline numbers. And over here, you're sort of, you know, you're going from, you know, this is the morphine, right? So the $120 billion a month, you're, you're, you know, put it in the needle, shoot it in the vein, Right that's going to get whittled down. Maybe they'll only do 100 or maybe they'll not, whatever they, they whittle it down by. But over here, the, what, what the standing repo facility and the FIMA swap lines combined with the, verse, re, with the reverse repo program gives them, a, basically that has put a, 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 an IV into markets vein. And that's on a drip. That's liquidity drip on sort of an as needed basis. So standing repo facility sounds really fancy. Anything that is eligible for standing repo is basically the Fed continuing to buy that on an, ad need, on an as needed basis. And so do I think they're going to taper? Yes, I do. Do I think they're actually going to withdraw liquidity? No, I don't. And I think to what end are they doing this? I think this goes back to our initial discussion of credibility. They have, they have it's on or it's off with debt and deficits and, and the situation we're in supply chains. They don't have a dial anymore. And so this goes back to my ongoing thing. They're trying to ride two horses with one ass, right? They, they want to convince you know, the, 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 the market they're going to inflate the debt away, but they want the bond market to not think they're going to inflate the debt away. And they're stuck. And I think they have credibility issues, and I think they know they have credibility issues. So how do you restore your credibility? You say you're going to taper. You start to actually taper, and everyone's going to pay attention to this headline number. Wow, they actually did it. And Everyone that's saying they're going to taper and the market's going to implode is going to be wrong, in my view. And when the market doesn't implode, the Fed can say, see, we told you we could get out of that. And in the meantime, the standing repo facility, reverse repo facility, and, and foreign swap lines 
our IV and whatever liquidity into the system as needed to keep. But where's it? But where would that liquidity be hitting? Like what? What type of enterprise or what type of uh, security? Or what type of security would be? It's going to be tre- the, so standing repo domestically is going to be treasuries and and mortgage backs. So and, it's just going straight back into the bond market like we've been doing for the last decade. Yeah, because now instead of them, so so that this, so it's, you just, the process, right? So look at the flows. So this is an oversimplification, but treasury spends money, issues bonds, banks buy some of those bonds, Fed prints money, buys those bonds from the banks that creates reserves in the banking system, right? And that's fine. But then when you get too many reserves, the banks can't lend on that other side. So reverse repo actually sterilizes that process. So that takes reserves off of the bank's balance sheets uh, and allows them to, to, to loan elsewhere. That creates regulatory cap space. Okay, so reverse repo helps alleviate that. But the, the, that's the straight QE program. Standing repo is basically treasury spends money, issues, re, issues treasuries to banks. We're not going to buy as many of those. We're tapering QE. But hey, oh, by the way, if you get tight, just come over here to our standing repo facility and we'll just give you the dollars and we'll repo them back and forth. What's the difference between repoing back and forth as needed over here versus the Fed showing up once a month or once a week and buying, you know, 120 billion a month of, of treasuries and more? None. Dollars are fungible. I mean, it doesn't freaking matter. So this so from a quantitative standpoint, the numbers all check out what you're saying, right? Mm-hmm. But qu- from a qualitative standpoint, this is just more obliteration of the middle class that we've seen since the 2008-2009 crisis. Like this is not getting the 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 liquidity into the hands of I mean you can drive through any town in this in this country right now there are very few towns that you can drive through where it does not look like uh, just total chaos you got you got people on the streets begging for money you got tent cities I mean you got stuff that if you would have showed it to me ten years ago I would have said there's no way this is the same country right. In these policies, how can they not really? I mean, I guess they they have to know that these policies are doing this, right? Don't I mean? Don't you think? I I think the Fed is. I think they're doing the best they can, and I think ultimately, if you say Luke, who's really who's really to blame here? You can only lay this at the feet of one group of people. Who do you lay it at the feet at? No question. I lay it at the politicians. I lay it at Congress. President. Because of the spendings driving them to make these decisions. It's this, yeah. These like yeah. they the 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 U.S. wrote. You know, if you go back, the issue was in in oh eight. The banks made all these subprime loans, and then they laid off all the risk on AIG. Right? AIG wrote this policy had no possible way of covering, and the United States government with Medicare, with Medicaid, with Social Security, with the Iraq War, with the veterans benefits that are, I mean, we're spending $200 billion a year in veterans benefits, and I, we should pay every dime. But someone should have thought about this, right? That was That's a premium. All of these things were the uh, sovereign equivalent of AIG writing an insurance policy. It has no capital to cover. The only capital to cover is the Fed's printing press. And so they're, the political choice is, hey, you don't get your social security. You don't, you know, you don't get your veterans benefits and you don't get Medicare, Medicaid, in which case you have a political crisis in this country or the Fed does all this and, and tries to sort of sleight of hand to, you know, and, and so to me, I lay it at the feet of the lack of adult leadership because this is in, in well, Washington. It's, it's short term focus Product. in interests that are that are driving decision making not long term 10 20 30 year uh decision making right right it's um, it's lack of leadership yeah at the end of the day i mean right i mean you're a military guy right when something needs to be done someone you know there is skin in the game in the military there's you know there's right and there's been no skin in the game it's been about getting reelected and it's human nature so i don't want to be too hard but it end of the day, 70 million baby boomers were born from 46 to 64. Stands to reason someday they were going to turn 65. So they had 65 years to reform this, what was effectively an AIG insurance policy with no capital when Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid went upside down. And the 80s were a giant party. The 90s were a giant party. We had surpluses. We were The Berlin Wall came down. The USSR collapsed. We had this wonderful window 
And the leaders that are running the joint now were in power then, and they they didn't do a thing. So let's go back to uh, your description of using the repo facilities and how they're going to try to taper. Let's say that the equity market sells off 20% from the top and, and maybe does it pretty quickly. Um, do you see them changing course and getting... Yes. W- okay. So what kind of type of percent do you think that's going to take for them to change course and say, oh, well, now we just, we're going to go back to, to easing again? What, what, what kind of correction are we talking here? Luke? It's probably in the 15 to 20% range. Maybe it's 10 to 15. Um, I mean, doesn't that, doesn't that just totally sh- demonstrate how insanely inept they are to actually manage any of this? Oh, they, they're screwed. Like they, they're, they're screwed if they do it. They're screwed if they don't. Like it's, I think Jim yeah. Grant has the best quote about the Fed. What would you do? What was the first thing you would do if you were named Fed governor? He's, he always answers resign. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, the system has been allowed to evolve to this point that they, one of the great stats I've heard has been something that Hirschman Capital wrote last summer, which is they look back 220 years, since 1800, 52 countries have hit 130% debt to GDP. And of those 52 countries, 51, 98% defaulted, uh, typically via high inflation or hyperinflation, if not outright restructuring. One country out of the 52, Japan, has not yet. Now, and then the United- look at and look at the currency and how dominant and how much of a network effect that fiat currency has in the global economy and it's massive. It's it's right? massive and yeah. but everybody says, well, we're Japan. So you've got 220 years. Everyone's like, well, it's never different this time. It's not different this time. We're Japan. And to me, it's it's one of these incredible cognitive dissonance, hubris, you know, American exceptionalism. Like, like no, no. If it's not different this time. You don't get 98% chances in markets very often. There's a 98% chance that we get high slash hyperinflation of, of some version as our way out of this. And so, and, and that's the way you get out of sovereign debt crisis. You inflate the debt away. But it's challenging because of this. The Fed is, the reason the Fed stuck is, is 98% of the time, you just inflate it away. But it's also this reserve currency. So, it, it has all, they're, they're trying to not inflate it away while, while knowing they need to inflate it away. It's, it's trying to ride two horses with one ass. What, what Bitcoin price would have to happen for the world to start saying, oh my God, what the hell is this? And, and, and especially in the fixed income kind of way where they'd be like, oh my God, is this becoming a global settlement layer? Right? Like what price w- are, do you think that that's happening? It's a great question. Um, so I think the way I would answer at the framework in my mind is I think it would have to be a multiple of gold's market cap before the fixed income people take it seriously. And so, right. So what's Bitcoin is call it a little less than a trillion now. At, yeah. At, it, when it's at 50, I think it was like at 50 to 55,000 a coin. It was at about a trillion. Okay. So you're, so you're probably 800 billion gold's whatever it is, 12 trillion. So let's say at a 20 trillion number. Yeah. Uh, at a 20 trillion market cap. So you're 166% of gold, assuming gold doesn't run anymore. Um, uh, what is a uh, 20 trillion divided by uh, 20 million is. So you're like, yeah, you're 20X from where you are now. Yeah. So you'd be yeah, about, so a, it's a million, about a million dollars. About a million dollars Bitcoin. Yeah. I think that's probably about right. I would have guessed just saying, hey, it's probably fought, you know, because you've seen guys come out and say 300,000, 400,000 price targets. So I think that would get people going, oh, wow, you know, but, but I think to really get the bond market and sort of real class, because when I put that chart up of, of um, it's a great chart by Dan Oliver at Mermican Capital, you and I've talked about it before. It shows the price of gold in Weimar, Germany, right? And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, you know, and I've commented multiple times that looks like the price of Bitcoin in dollars. Yeah. And sort of a lot of, of more mainstream practitioners laugh at me, right? And, you know, some of the bond guys on Twitter, I'm not going to, you know, but they've, they've openly mocked me for, for saying that. So yeah. that to me tells you, you probably need 10, 20 times and, you know, then they won't be laughing. 
And, and I, then it's going to be too late for them. Yeah. And it's uh, <laughs> what makes markets. Hey, so uh, you have a quote. Uh, you posted this on Twitter. I love this. You said, economists routinely say debt is deflationary, but most fail to mention that virtually all of the great inflations in modern history have occurred when an insolvent fiat currency issuing nation has attempted to maintain the nominal solvency of its sovereign debt. What are you getting at here? Sovereign debt. So sovereign debt can't be allowed to default. I mean, it technically could, but it can't. Politically, the United States cannot default on its debt. And so when you look at a lot of the great high inflations throughout history, it's been when you have a sovereign with the ability to print domestic fiat currency to address the, the, its bond market, to basically pretend that the bond market is, that is still, you know, it ties back to the point that 10-year treasuries at 1.3%. Yeah. To pretend that that's actually a real rate, it's going to take more and more money created to pretend that's 1.3%. And we're seeing that with the Fed's balance sheet. So you, there was a person who responded to you and they said, when does the debt go from depressive to manic? And <laughs> you said that you, that you love this phrase. I love this phrase yeah. because what you're getting at is, is, are we talking about like something right now today where we've got a 400 basis point spread that does not make any sense fundamentally to somebody that would be looking at this and holding it for, through the maturity date. Um, when does it turn from like, hey, this is, this is really strange to, oh my God, this is looking a little scary to just total fear, everybody running, screaming their heads off? So I think we have a couple more iterations. Um, and it might be as little as one more iteration. And one of the things I'm watching on that is it's an incredible number. And this speaks to why we have the inflation, the CPI inflation that we have, and ties back to what we talked about before, which is, I want to make sure I quote the number right, uh, U.S. government transfer payments as a percent of personal consumption expenditures, or PCE. So PCE is a very broad category. It's crap you buy at Walmart, boats, cars, healthcare services, et cetera. It's like a $16 trillion line item. It's two-thirds of the economy. So U.S. government, it's consumer spending, broad. U.S. government transfer payments, money the U.S. government is just giving consumers as a percent of U.S. consumer spending, which is two-thirds of GDP, re recently was 33%. So one-third of two-thirds of the economy is being given to the consumer by the government. So... Some of that is counter-cyclical coming out of COVID, but a lot of it isn't. It's Social Security, it's, it's, it's Medicare, yeah. it's, right? And so the reason I say we might have another iteration or two is, in theory, there's sort of three ways out of this. And sort of happy way out of this is we get a big spate of economic productivity, some sort of revolutionary technology or something happens. We all go back to work, whatever. And you get economic productivity increases. You get real GDP growth, a big bump up in real GDP growth. And that can make the numbers work. The debt to GDP falls um, and they can work down government transfer payments and, and, and the deficits as a percent of GDP, as a percent of PCE. And that's sort of the happy ending. It's inflationary, but that's sort of good inflationary. You know, it's, it's, that's good. If we don't do that, then the other two options are, option number one is sort of, I think they try to work down, you know, they try to work down government transfer payments as a percent of PCE. The economy pre promptly goes into a recession if we don't get that pickup in productivity. Economy goes into recession with debt this high, then either you get a collapse in assets with a rise in treasury yields like we saw start to happen in March of 2020, that's a fiscal crisis and we spiral, you know, either the Fed steps up and buys whatever they have to buy, or we see asset prices, you know, you, you see a balance of payments crisis in the United States, asset prices falling towards zero, yields rising sharply uh, until the Fed stops that. And so my question is, is I think I'm still not seeing the productivity enhancement that drives real GDP growth. So if we set aside that doesn't happen, to answer your question, when do we get the holy crap moment of, oh God, this is never stopping, is 
I think it's probably the next time they try to pull back the stimulus and then the Fed's got to go from whatever, $8 trillion to 16 or $20 trillion on the balance sheet to sort of restabilize things. And if it's not then, then I think it's highly likely the next iteration after that. So I, I think they have at most two iterations and maybe as few as one iteration. But I don't think it's it's a broad psychological phenomenon. I think there's a growing recognition that something's not right, but I don't think... But it's going to be like, and, yeah, I think, yeah, it'll be quick when it happens. What induces that, Luke? Is it going to be just them trying to tighten or do do something and they just kind of get behind the the power curve of, of trying to do too much and it just turns into contagion? So like, for example, let's say they're going to try to tighten here in the coming months. They just let it kind of get too far out of hand. It's down 20% and the next morning it wakes up and it's down almost like a 1980s scenario where it was down 40% in a day. And if that plays out, I mean, they're coming to the table and they're coming to the table with probably double whatever they did during the COVID drop, right? I, th- I think that's right. I think it's ultimately just that. Mismanagement. That, that, and then to me, it's within that. And then I, it probably also has to be a broader recognition amongst professionals exactly how far gone the fiscal situation has been left post COVID. Right. So, you know, when I tell people, look, if you, if you look at the U S government's true, what I would call their true interest expense, which is just treasury spending, which is like interest. And then whatever they're doing with COVID and stuff still, which blew up treasury spending, uh, which I include because if you take it away, GDP is going to fall and that creates problem. Right. So treasury spending plus uh, entitlements, just the pay-as-you-go portion of entitlements, which is just the sort of annual interest, if you will, to float the hundred trillion plus in entitlements. Those two numbers in the latest Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee report are 111 percent of tax receipts, with tax receipts at all-time highs, with an everything silly, ludicrous bubble in everything. And I mean, that's within- totally nuts. And I, it's totally nuts. It's totally irrecoverable, right? You're in the sort of the goose and maverick flat spin. Like it's not, you're, you're, you're not going to. It's, and it's just not the U.S., right? I mean, you're, you're seeing a similar dynamic playing out. You name it country. This is the same scenario for every other country in the world, right? It, it is to varying degrees. It depends. Nobody else needs as much foreign capital as we do. Uh, because we were the sponsors of the system, right? We ran deficits. Yeah. And, and so everybody else has the same, particularly in the West, the, the entitlement problems. They don't have as bad a capital importing problem as we do. Um, now, paradoxically, the Fed has stepped up and filled that gap. That's what they're doing is basically, you know, foreign creditors, I've either stopped because they don't want to or because they can't because they have some of their own problem in the same way. They need to keep that capital home. Uh, the Fed has filled that gap. If the Fed stops filling that gap to tie in with our earlier discussion, paradoxically, what's going to happen is the dollar's not going to collapse, is the dollar's going to skyrocket because now the U.S. government's going to steal. That's that's sort of the milkshake. The U.S. will steal dollar liquidity from the rest of the world. rest of the world will collapse and then we'll collapse after them. Um, but it's it's, I think, to answer the original question, I think, I get the distinct sense still that amongst policymakers, this flat spin is recoverable. And and the only way it it, it is recoverable is with sort of like the equivalent of like a rollout of something, some revolutionary productivity enhancing technology on in line with like nuclear fusion portable in our backyard, like in within a year, two years, right? Like it's, you need something. It's like a, a leap forward in productivity. So maybe they're working on it. I'm, I'm fingers crossed, but otherwise. So we need magic. <laughs> we need, we need magic. And, and if we don't get magic, I think really that's the thing you can't measure. Like, I think the thing you can say, okay, when is there a greater recognition that they're never getting out of this? without that productivity enhancer, it could be an event, right? Of, hey, they tried to pull back. It didn't work. The balance sheet went from $8 trillion to $20 trillion for the Fed in, in nine months. That could be part of it. But I, there's also, I think, and this is the, the, the scarier part of it or the more unknowable part is when sort of the hundredth monkey in, in, in sort of, you know, realizes 
this is an irrecoverable flat spin. When you look at the finances of the U.S., of the West more broadly, they're not getting out of this. They're not different than the other 98% of people that have been in this position over the last 220 years. That's when it can happen like that. When you talk to people like Simon Mikhailovich, right? It's just, it's like a thief in the night. Boom. Then you wake up and all of a sudden, you know, it, it's, it's the common knowledge game, right? Uh, um, uh, uh, gosh, uh, Epsilon Theory, Ben Hunt does so well, right? Yeah. It was like everybody in Hollywood knew about Harvey Weinstein and no one did a damn thing. And then all of a sudden, er one day everyone woke up and everyone was like, oh, he's bad. And yeah. it's the same kind of thing here. It's like, well, everyone's going to know. Yeah. And one day we're all going to wake up and that's going to be that. We're like, how, how did we live through such a crazy <laughs> time? <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts on Gary Ginsler uh, and all the things that he's talking about with respect to digital assets? I had a tweet up today and I actually took it out. I don't delete a lot of tweets. I deleted one after about two minutes simply because I read the article um, and I thought he was including Bitcoin in there. And, and uh, um, Plan B pointed out that he's he is not lumping Bitcoin in with sort of everything else. So I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt, him him being Gensler. Um, were you, were you taking a shot at, at Bitcoin, Luke? No, I, I didn't I was see this. A, no, the tweet that I had up was something that basically, you know, I, I was lumping, I was assuming he was taking a shot at Bitcoin. And so I was oh. saying, um, you know, and you, you know what they say happens when you assume. So that was, uh, I was assuming he was taking a shot at Bitcoin and my tweet was just that, listen, he's, he's coming down on Bitcoin and the Chinese communist party has come down on Bitcoin. And if it doesn't make sense to you that the head of the SEC and the Chinese Communist Party are aligned on Bitcoin, you're not the only one, right? Like, it's, you know, someone yeah, explain I mean, that to me, right? His, his big thing is on the stable coins. He's actually, uh, I, th I think he has a Bitcoin position. I think he's had a Bitcoin position ever since he was teaching it at MIT. Yeah, and Plan and, B said that, that not so much yeah. that he had that position, but that he has, he has, he's on the record as saying that it is a store of value, um, you know, uh, asset or what have you. So, yeah. That 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 made more sense, and so yeah, that's why that's why I I took that down. So it's, I look I I would defer to Caitlin Long on 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 the stablecoin stuff. Yeah, um, I yes. think she would tell you that he's probably onto something with some of these stable coins in terms of. Well, I think he's looking at organizations like hers where yep. she's trying to stand up Avanti. She wants to have a stable coin and it's mostly for clearing reasons so that she can immediately clear yep. and keep pace with the new digital age and uh, the store of value that Bitcoin provides. And so I think from, from Ginsler's point of view, he's looking at all of this. I mean, how many, there's 10,000 tokens or whatever listed on various exchanges on coin, uh, coin market cap or whatever. And I think yep. Ginsler is looking at it and he's just like, this is insane. <laughs> and <laughs> this needs to be, this needs to be controlled. And I'm not saying my opinion, this is, this is, as far as I'm concerned, let it be a free and open market. If people go in there and they get hosed, well, I guess they're going to learn a lesson, right? That's kind of, I'm, I'm like free markets through and through, like stop the manipulation. That's, that's why we're, where we're at right now. Um, but anyway, I think Ginsler's point of view is that uh, the stable coins, because they're going to be touching the US Fed and, and all these other fiat currencies needs to be regulated, especially some of these ones that are, you know, 50 billion in market cap or whatever they are, he's looking at that and saying, this is crazy that there's really no regulatory body overseeing these things. Right. And uh, I think that's where he's coming from, especially when you get into, Caitlin does such a great job talking about the, the clearing side of things where some of these uh, banks, they might have these things and the way that they're, they're having to capitalize themselves, they're doing, um, they basically adjust the books at the end of every day and they're dealing with this thing that's clearing, in some cases, on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. And so if you're a bank and you're thinking that you're meeting certain capital requirements by having enough capital in reserves, and um, you're, you're not expecting to adjudicate that until the end of the day, and meanwhile, you have these tokens that are swapping in and out and all over the place, um, what should the capital requirements be for something that can be exchanged that fast? especially when you have all these other things on your books that are clearing so much slower. And I think that's where Ginsler is looking at it and saying, um, if we don't do something about this soon, because this market's exploding in, in size, this stable coin space. 
uh, we need to do something about this now. And I, it's just, it's wild. And then I'm sure you saw the whole Coinbase thing with um, where Coinbase is trying to work with the SEC and the SEC is like, no, we're just going to, we're just going to sue you and we're, we're not going to provide guidance as to what we're looking for. And I saw then, some headlines today. I didn't have a chance to really, you know, it's oh, like, it's, yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Hey, um, so when we look at all this stuff that's happening, mm-hmm. the, the, the thing that most people are thinking is, okay, so Luke, so where do I position myself? Obviously you like Bitcoin, you like gold, but like what other sectors or what other things are you looking at right now based on the insanity that a person can position themselves in their portfolio that you would recommend? So uh, there's an, an, uh, another theme that we've been writing a lot about over the last really, uh, you know, almost a year year now has been i think i think peak cheap oil has returned as a theme and peak cheap oil is not to say that we're running out of oil but we're running out of cheap oil we've run out of cheap oil uh and if you look at for example uh x us shale um world has really not grown uh global oil production in almost 10 12 years uh in any real way while demand has risen a bunch. And that's relevant because when you look at what shale has done, they've effectively high graded a lot of their reserves, uh, which is to say, you know, they did what any smart private business capital, you know, capitalistic business was do, which is because of the unique aspects of that business has very high depletion rates. You produce a bunch up front in the first three months, and then it tails off very fast and then uh, has a long flat tail on it. But the point is, is that they produced all their best locations first, all their A locations they went to, they drilled it. And those of all, they, they knew where a lot of this stuff was and they went to it and they did. And then they went to the B locations, C locations. And some of that, the high grading had to do with the cyclicality of the business. We went through these vicious cycles in 14 and again in, uh, in, in 20, excuse me, 15, 16. And then in, and then in 20, um, and some of it's just the geology of it. The point is, is that between the geology and, and how they high graded this uh, because of the business cycle, there, you, it doesn't look like there's a lot of more, you know, there's, there's not another 15 million barrels a day of shale coming online like there has been over the last 10, 15 years. And so maybe there is elsewhere, but there's going to need to be a price impulse there to drive it. And at the same time, something I've noticed that has been really, really interesting to me has been uh, this sudden desire by global automakers, uh, Audi, GM, Mercedes-Benz, I think uh, Nissan, among others. Uh, Audi was the one that really first caught our attention by saying, we want to have, I think they're saying all electric by 2026. And Mercedes is going to be mostly electric by then. GM is going to have 30, you know, 30 electric cars by, I think, 2025 or 2028. And this struck me as odd because these auto companies tend to be very big, political, slow-moving organizations. Uh, and no disrespect, they have brilliant engineers and, and, and they put out great product. I drive some of their products. I love them. With that said... They tend to be slow-moving, big political organizations. They have supply chains that stretch around the world to support internal combustion engines. My understanding is that electric, uh, the electric vehicle market is basically an entirely different supply chain than internal combustion engines. It's not just sort of like, hey, you know, send the trucks here instead of here that day, and it's and, and you make no, it's totally different. And where I'm going with this is. Companies like this that tend have historically been big and slow moving that have made, in the case of GM, all their money or most of their money in big gas guzzling trucks, deciding to make what is a, a, a monumental shift of their supply chains in a co- very compressed period of time. We're talking about five years to a completely new supply chain. And why are they doing this? And so the, 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 to me, there's two most reasonable explanations. Uh, option number one is these executives have decided to basically wager 100 plus year old companies, literally wager the company on a virtue signaling exercise around climate change now, just out of the blue. Or option number two is that 
these are nationally um, tied in companies. Audi, Audi is owned by Volkswagen. They're the biggest corporation in Germany. They are the biggest employer in Germany. And the German military in 2010 said peak oil will probably be here by 2013 and it will begin to impact uh, the economy by about 2026, which happens to be the same year that Audi and Mercedes, another big German automaker, are both set as their target date to basically go all electric. So option number one is these big, gigantic global automakers have decided to wager 100-year-old companies and supply chains on a virtue signal exercise. And option number two is these big global national companies have been tapped on the shoulders by their national security apparatus, as Intola said, there is a, an acute fossil fuel supply demand imbalance coming circa 2025, 2026, 2027. And you need to move to your supply chains fast. Go. And to me, the virtue signaling exercise doesn't hold water. Yeah, I'm and, with you. Do, and, do you have friends that, that kind of buy into the second narrative there? I'm, I'm with you 100%. Yes. Yeah, they, they absolutely buy into the narrative. And I've talked to people in the energy business, manufacturing business. I've not said anybody that said, no, Luke, it's just a virtue signaling exercise. I think <laughs> it's, it's been unanimous that, that there's a fossil, a fossil fuel supply yeah. demand issue. You can go back to Matt Simmons' work in 05 with Twilight in the Desert and some of the things he wrote about. You can look at the, you know, the, 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 the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule holding for global oil supplies, where if you look, it's stunning when you really start digging into it. Like, like 100 fields produce like 30 or 40 percent of the, of the world's oil, and, and like they're all 50 years old or older, right? So it all sort of adds up. And at any rate, where I go with all this by way of background in terms of a theme is twofold. Number one, the peak cheap oil thing I let off with, but then number two, uh, Anything electric vehicle supply chain from a commodity standpoint, metal standpoint, um, I think that sector, I think probably has uh, very powerful tailwinds coming um, as matters of national security for multiple countries um, for probably at least the next several years. Luke, we could talk all night. Uh, <laughs> this, is how they, this is how these conversations always end. We could talk all night. Um, but thanks for coming on the show. I want to highlight your book. Uh, you got two of them with the Mr. X interviews are fantastic. Um, if you're Thank listening you. to Luke and you're saying, how that, how does this guy know so much breadth? Um, I would tell you having read his books, um, I just had a, a much deeper appreciation and it helped me understand Luke himself and kind of the way he processes information from a, from a macro standpoint uh, through those books. So I can't promote the books highly enough. I love those, the, the books that you uh, put out there, Luke. And uh, give people a handoff if they want to learn more about you. Um, give them a handoff where they can learn more. Absolutely. Yeah. They can check us out. Uh, our website's FFTT-LLC.com. You can uh, noodle around on there, find out what we're up to. Also, our different product offerings, uh, retail and institutional investors. And uh, then I have a pretty uh, pretty active Twitter feed at, at Luke Groman, L-U-K-E-G-R-O-M-E-N. I think I spelled my name right. It's all one word uh, uh, on Twitter. And he's always deleting tweets whenever I'm up <laughs> there. <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Luke, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's always a pleasure to have you. Oh, thanks for having me on, Preston. I always enjoy talking. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below. 